Hey guys, welcome back to Nifty Invest. In this expert video, we delve into Rafi Farber's insightful video on the topic of inflation and its implications for our society. Farber explains how inflation is akin to theft and why this concept is of paramount importance in today's economic landscape. As we explore his perspectives, we'll also touch upon the potential consequences of such monetary policies. So let's dive into this critical subject matter and gain a deeper understanding of inflation as theft. Rafi Farber starts his discussion by emphasizing that the problem with inflation is that it essentially amounts to stealing from the general population. He asserts that our entire economic system is currently based on this form of theft. The premise is straightforward. When an entity, typically a central authority, has the ability to create claims on real goods and services out of thin air, it results in an unjust enrichment for that entity at the expense of everyone else. Stealing a physical object, like a car or a chair, deprives the owner of that item while the thief benefits. Inflation operates similarly, but instead of physical theft, it's a financial manipulation that takes value from the broader population. Over time, if this process continues, it leads to an erosion of wealth, harming the middle class and benefiting a select group of individuals and organizations. To emphasize this point, Farber references an old text, Beliefs and Opinions, by Rabbi Stadia Gaon, which dates back to around 800 CE. In this text, Gaon asks why the Bible forbids stealing, and he provides an answer that resonates with Farber's argument. It's because permitting theft in any form eventually depletes the resources available to society, leading to its eventual collapse. This ancient wisdom serves as a strong foundation for understanding the dire consequences of inflation as a form of theft. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoy the content we do here on this channel. Let's get right into the video. Well, the basis of the problem is that inflation is stealing and the entire system of exchange right now is based on theft. And when you have a society that's based on theft, that society ultimately collapses because you run out of things to steal. Uh, when you run out of things to steal, everyone gets poor and then the political organization or the monetary organization or whatever is keeping society together dissipates. And then that allows free markets to pop up, you know, across, you know, around different pockets and then you rebuild from there. So um, it, how, how to explain that inflation is theft is, you know, it's pretty easy. Um, if someone can just invent a claim on real goods and services and force people to use it, they can just invent it out of literally nothing or say it's a digit or a piece of paper or whatever it is and say, okay, now I can take this out of the economy and use it for myself. So he added nothing and he took out something. So then you have less stuff for other people, more stuff for you. That's the same functional uh, result as stealing something. When you steal somebody's car or when you steal somebody's chair or whatever it is that you steal, you have it and they don't have it. And eventually, if you steal from everybody, they have less things, you have more things, and then you run out of things, and then they stop making things, and then there are no more things, and then everybody starves to death. Uh, that's, that's, the very, that's the most simple way to put it. Um, so I, I quote this a lot when I'm asked this question. Um, in the library behind me, there's a book um, called Beliefs and Opinions by, by a rabbi named Saja Gaon, who wrote it about 1400 years ago and around 800 of the common era in the late, late middle, late dark ages. And he asked the question, why does the Bible, you know, forbid stealing? And he says this exact reason, because if it allowed people to steal and said, it's fine to steal, steal whatever you want, then what happens is you run out of things and then everybody dies. So that's, that's the simplest way. So what is the end game? The, the end game is basically when the public realizes that they're being stolen from, they stop making stuff. And, uh, you know, you could read Ayn, Ayn Rand has a version of this in, um, in Atlas Shrugged where, you know, the, the people that produce things, they kind of separate from society and make their own uh, Gold's Gulch society in some island somewhere, I don't remember. Um, but the, the, the end game is basically the end of the system of theft because it cannot, it cannot continue because literally you'll just run out of stuff. And that's what's happening. And you can see that in the, the middle class getting poorer and the connected inflation class, whoever benefits from inf inflation, that could be banks, it could be the military industrial complex, it could be the politicians' friends, or the, you know, the insider traders in the Senate, which is, you know, or, or the Congress, which is, you know, all the same stuff, the World Economic Forum, all these people, they, they benefit from the same stuff. And they're all on the same team, just different factions. 
The end game of inflation, according to Farber, is when the public becomes acutely aware that they are being systematically robbed through monetary policies. This awareness leads to a significant reduction in the production of goods and services, as people realize the futility of their efforts in the face of diminishing returns. This trend mirrors concepts found in Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged, where productive individuals retreat from society to create their own self-sustaining communities in response to a system that exploits them. Farber asserts that the end of an inflationary system is inevitable because it's unsustainable. As the central authorities continue to print money at an increasing rate, their ability to claim goods and services diminishes, eventually leading to a point where their power collapses. The culmination of these factors forces a reset, but it won't be on the terms of the entities that have profited from inflation. Instead, it will likely occur amid societal upheaval and a breakdown of the established order. Farber places the current inflationary scenario within the context of historical empires and governments. He observes that throughout history, governments have followed a recurring pattern. They expand their power, conquer new territories, and extract tribute from their conquests. However, as they exhaust external resources, they turn to internal sources and resort to inflating their currency, which eventually leads to their downfall. He cites the example of the Roman Empire, which succumbed to this very pattern. Farber acknowledges that historical instances of inflation played out over extended periods, unlike the accelerated pace of modern societies. He points out that while the Roman Empire inflated its currency over hundreds of years, today's monetary inflation is occurring at a much faster rate. Consequently, he predicts that the consequences will also manifest more rapidly. So, um, the, the, the inflation is going to be ineffective, meaning when they print more money, it's not going to be able to claim any more goods and services. And then they'll lose all their power and then there'll be a reset, but a reset not on their terms, but on our terms. And there's no hour. We're not like one unit here that has, you know, one agenda. There's many different agendas because there's many different markets and we'll break up into that, that sort of thing again. Just like, you know, the, the story of the flood in the Torah and the Bible, you know, whether you believe in it literally or not, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it actually happened. It's telling you that if you have a society that steals, it's going to collapse, whether through flood or whether through natural just dissipation. So that's where we are. This is this is the same stuff that that kills any empire. Uh, you know, the, the history and the stories of governments throughout the world is a gov governments get more powerful and they conquer more places and they take tribute from those places and then they get more power, get more places, get more control. And then eventually they run out of they run out of things to conquer. So they start inflating the money uh, and stealing from internally from the empire that way. And then things start to fall apart, which is exactly what happened to Rome. It's exactly what happens to every government. They all clip their coins in one way or another. This is just a modern way of doing it. So if you look, if you look at history, it's the same. It's the same pattern over and over again. Now you, you could say, well, you know, Rome uh, inflated for 300, 400 years before there was a collapse. Fine. So you could say uh, maybe maybe it'll last another 300, 400 years from now. But then. You know the the rate of the rate of inflation in Rome was much much slower. It was like, in in, in money supply terms, they were clipping coins maybe at one to two percent a year, something like that. Slowly ebbing the the silver content of the coins away over hundreds of years of time. Here it's like it's much faster, and and you can because modern societies go much quicker than than you know ancient societies. So. Uh, what I, what I believe is there's going to be one more round of inflation, meaning one more by inflation, I mean, ex increasing the, the money substitute supply, increasing the money supply is increasing the gold or silver supply, which is fine. Um, the reason it's a good money is because it's very hard to do. You need to do a lot of work and it costs money to do it. So you need to have a profit margin. And that's what naturally regulates the money supply according to what you, what you can dig out. So that's why gold and, that's one of the reasons why gold and silver are good money, but increasing the, the money substitute supply, basically going vertical, um, then it has to continue going at that rate in order to, in, in order to keep the pyramid sustaining. Because the more money you print, the more layers of finance are built on top of this enormous pyramid. And then you have to build the base, you have to keep building at a faster and faster rate until you just go vertical. And we're very near the vertical part now. <laughs> we're in the we're in the final the final lull the final depression of the money supply before the next financial crisis kicks in, and then from there they'll just print the the everybody will print to death and that'll be the end of it. When I say inflation and deflation, I assume we're talking about the money supply Obviously. and not the the, the yeah. effect 
of the money supply on prices where you can see like your grocery bill goes up by 10% and whatever. Okay, that's not what we're talking about. That's just an effect. Yeah. Um, and this, this is not just an academic point. It's very important. Farber believes that there is still one more round of inflation to come, marked by a substantial increase in the supply of money substitutes, such as fiat currency. This final phase will involve escalating the money supply at an exponential rate, pushing the pyramid of financial structures to its limits. As the layers of finance build upon each other, they will rely on an ever-increasing base of money creation. Farber contends that we are approaching the apex of this inflationary period. This stage will be marked by the final depression of the money supply before the next financial crisis takes hold. The response to this crisis will likely involve massive money printing by central authorities, which, in turn, will lead to a culmination of the inflationary process. This, Farber suggests, will herald the end of the current economic system. To provide clarity, Farber distinguishes between inflation and deflation. In his analysis, these terms relate to changes in the money supply and their effect on prices, rather than the more common understanding of inflation as an increase in consumer prices. Farber points out that the money supply, particularly the US dollar supply, is currently deflating at a significant rate. He supports this argument by presenting a chart based on the methodology of his economics teacher, Robert Winslow, who looked at the quarterly average of the money supply's growth rate. The chart illustrates that, as of the most recent data, the money supply is contracting at a rate not seen in decades. Farber indicates that this level of monetary deflation usually portends a financial crisis. The last time such a scenario occurred was in 2008, leading to a substantial financial downturn. However, the situation at present is more severe, and the consequences are likely to be more significant. Uh, so yeah, we are we are undergoing a very strong period of deflation now because the money supply, and I, I don't know about every other country, I haven't researched every country, um, but the, the dollar supply is definitely deflating now and deflating pretty quickly. And um, I, you allow me to share a screen here so I can share a screen of the, the rate at which it is deflating. So let me go there. Um, this is the one chart I prepared. So this is a chart you're not going to find it anywhere. I, I made it myself. Um, it comes from my teacher in economics, uh, Robert Wenzel, who was the, um, he was a blogger for, he, he owned the economic policy journal.com and targetliberty.com. He passed away in 2021, May, 2021. But his method of counting the money supply was he would take um, the quarterly average, um, you know, it, money supply comes out each week. So you take the last 13 weeks, which was would be the, the money supply for the quarter, the average, and then, um, and then get the rate at which that is expanding and then multiply it by four. And then you have an annualized, you know, how fast the money supply is going on an annualized quarterly basis. So you can see here from, from 1982, right? This is going all the way back to as far as the Fed has weekly records. Um, and here, this spike here, in 2020, that was the most recent inflation of the money supply, and it was um, it was pretty insane. Uh, I've never seen anything close to it at all. Uh, since then, you have this humongous collapse in the rate of money supply growth, and now we, this down here, where you see my, do you see my arrow like circling it? Yeah. So right here, uh, this is the latest data we have, and I think the numbers are something like negative four percent. Right, we've never been there before ever. Um, so then uh, you can see. Uh, for example, in 2008, on the, this circle here was the was when it last went below zero, right? And so that triggered a huge financial crisis, and then they printed money, and you can see that spike here. But this was much smaller than what we saw over here. It was nothing compared to it. Uh, so, you know, basically every time we see this sort of monetary deflation, it means eventually there's going to be some kind of a crisis. Now, the 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 only exception you can you can avoid it, right, by massively increasing productivity. Right? If there's if there's some kind of historical anomaly where you're inflating the money supply, but all of a sudden there's this like huge new technology that you can just like pop out goods and services like nothing, uh, then you're not going to see the effect on prices, and then the, the pyramid can keep being built without even the money supply expanding, and that that can work. So one example of where we saw that was uh, in the the mid the mid 90s, right? Mid 1990s, the money supply was falling um, because the the Fed had undergone this um, huge. Uh, tightening campaign in 1994. It was a very bad year for the bond market, right? Because they, they were hiking 75 basis points. Three times they did that. That was in the mid-90s. And so you'll say, oh, well, why didn't everything crash back then? Well, the answer was because the internet was starting to get popular. It was really globalizing trade and, and goods and services started to get a lot cheaper in, in, in real terms. But like the, but the, so the, the falling money supply didn't really cause a financial crisis because everyone got richer in real terms anyway. 
Now, is that happening now? No, it's not. People are people are definitely getting poorer. We see it everywhere. I see it in my neighborhood. I see it in, in other cities. I mean, it's pretty obvious now. Um, so, uh, when does this uh, when does this last financial crisis hit? Don't know exactly. I can't say exactly. There's some kind of hangover. It looks like from the last inflation, like when the money supply increased by 50% annualized. So there's still some extra money in the system that has to be burned out. Uh, and then from there, you know, it should it should be triggered, and it should it, it'll probably be in housing and bonds, something like that. And uh, then the Fed's going to have to print, regardless of how much the CPI or the consumer prices are rising. And uh, then there will be a big dump of uh, of money everywhere. It'll be like hungry now, but worse.